Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. And I'm Tom Scholey. Today we're going to look at Alan Moore's uh, Supreme, specifically the EC homage issue. But before we do, Tom, tell us about your latest graphic novel. You can check out Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics. It's the story of Jack Kirby's life in comic book form, uh, you know, from A to Z. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Tom Scholey. You can check out um, Fantastic Four Grand Design. Uh, you can watch my YouTube show, Total Recall Show. And uh, you can check out my Patreon at patreon.com. Just search Tom Scholey. How about you, Ed? Tell us about Red Room. Red Room Comics, Out in the Wild, Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game in the Red Room universe. And uh, as of June 30th, there are two issues of Red Room in print. Uh, new strips and new comics coming out every four weeks or so for a while. You could read all the comics ahead of time on my Patreon, patreon.com slash edpiscor. Three bucks gets you the archive there, and you could read uh, well over 100 pages worth of stuff up there, which comprises of more than five issues worth of material. You could order and pre-order the comics uh, through the Fantagraphics website if you don't have a sh sh good store close by. All these links are in uh, the link tree in the description below uh, this video. You can join me on patreon.com slash jimrug, where you can download my out-of-print, hard-to-find zines and mini-comics, like this collection of my ballpoint pen drawings. I have about a dozen of these available right now. You can see a lot of my original art, including the original, the process, the sketches behind the Red Room comic variants that I've been doing, including the latest one, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles variant for issue number three. So you can find all that and a lot more at patreon.com slash jimrug. We could get started with just the cover because you yeah. could see like the faux like EC horror hosts up top mm -hmm. it, and like the Extreme Studios guys, or in this case, Maximum Press guys, <laughs> they just can't do like anything other than what they their sort of like 1990s image flavor was about, you know? Stephen Platt's worst comic book cover. <laughs> wow. That's because I like this cover. Like, like it, it just speaks to me, uh, you know. But but that's in, that's interesting. I want to see all his other covers and see you know, if that holds up. I don't know how big of a Platt fan I mean, you, you guys are. are way into Platt. Way, I have but Stephen I, Platt I like on my walls. Yeah, at home. <laughs> you guys are way, way more. Yeah. And I just think, like, when I think of Stephen Platt, this doesn't check off any of the boxes of, like, the reason I would buy Stephen Platt. Uh, it's not on this cover. This is when he starts to tighten up and sort of, like, burnish off all of the cool stuff that, that we really like liked about him. And uh, he's not inking this either, so that's also a piece of it. I need to see shell casings flying. <laughs> or at least some hatching on those quads that seem to be uh, oc octos. Yeah, give me give, give me some veins on those quads. <laughs> yeah, maybe this is uh, Platt doing his, like, sort of retro old-school comics thing because it, it you would Fuel get rid lines. of a lot of that stuff you know uh got some uh pre-com <laughs> <laughs> i was trying like how to describe something dripping out of the barrel of this gun skeet skeet <laughs> and skeet, i mean skeet. that's a, that's a gun that shoots wax that's uh wax uh, wax man yes who, uh his, he's he's kind of like um He's he's kind of like the Sandman, but instead of shooting like gas guns, oh, he's he a lot like Sandman. Man. Yeah, yeah. These are <laughs> like these are all obvious analogs, and you could almost imagine that like uh, Alan Moore had some version of this story ready to go when he was working at DC, and it's like okay, you know, here's Superman, here's all these guys, and just just kind of had to move a couple little little pieces around. And I even <laughs> wonder, did, did did does DC own? The EC because they have Mad. Do right. they own the DC com the EC comics? I don't think so. I, I okay. don't think so. Like with all of the moving and shuffling that Gaines did to uh, keep Mad going, that seemed to be divested from from the other stuff, man. Because you mm -hmm. wouldn't have Fantagraphics books and Dark Horse books, and right. DC's never done like the EC archives. You know, just always Mad stuff. But it does beg the question, like if this was a DC comic, right? Like, yeah. because you could still do the fake bullshit easy you, stuff. Yeah, you could keep them exactly because, as they are, yeah. Yeah, because the, the, the only thing you have to change what is the horror hosts, Yeah, you know? but And it, and then you could keep the mad stuff as mm -hmm. close as possible. I like this guy's face. It's like a hand symbol for uh, a face if you look close. Kind of a neat mask. Yeah, I think, it, what's his name? Shadow Man or hand pu Shadow Puppet or something? Yeah, like, but something like that. He's like Green Lantern, but instead he has a light on his chest and he makes Shadow Puppets... And then those become real. Like, it's kind of a clever, like, twist on, on Green Lantern. Boy, you're asking a lot of your artists. <laughs> you know, like, you, you I don't think to Robert, draw hands. You don't think Robert Napton is up <laughs> for the task? That seems like some heavy lifting. And you can see, so 
Moore comes on here, I think, with issue 41 or something and mm -hmm. does kind of a about a two year run on Supreme yeah. that's very well regarded. You can see that some fan awards already getting noticed only a couple of issues into his run. So kind of an interesting comic for this time period mm -hmm. of, of late 90s. Uh, Alan Moore always going to turn heads yeah. and uh, possibly maybe laying the foundation for whenever he starts doing his line with D with Jim Lee. Completely. Yeah. And uh, it's like a, it's a 12 issue storyline like yeah he's on the on the comic for like two years but it's a 12 and it's called the supreme story of the year and it is like each month has a chapter you know tw you know 12 issues the, the the watchmen model telling a complete story of sort of like the return of the original supreme so so you know i only read this issue okay so fill in some gaps man so so our supreme <sighs> guy is he's like a penciler or something you know yeah like i mean i i think of like I think of this thing in the context of like the whole the whole story, so it is interesting just picking an issue. But like this was like a good one because of the EC and Rick Veach doing his his EC twist. But yeah, um, Supreme uh, um, comes around and he's like, "I have amnesia. I don't know who I am. I think maybe I just came into being a couple minutes ago." And it's because you know Alan Moore's being very like on the surface about revisions and like he's the new writer on. So it's like um, Supreme has been around for decades, but he's actually only been around as of page one of this run. And uh, he uh, kind of is learning about his life, like, as he's walking through it. Like, oh, I guess he walks in a door and he's like, oh, I guess I work at a comic book uh, company. And he's like, oh, I guess I'm a penciler. You can see his comic book page is tucked under his arm. Yeah, so he, there's there's all this meta within meta. So, yeah, he's a comic book penciler, much like Steve Rogers was during the, um, the John Byrne run on Captain America. Uh, uh, he's he's a a uh, comic book penciler, and he's working on a another Superman analog. Called I was thinking Omni -Man. Of, of grips, but okay, we'll go with John Byrne. <laughs> and uh, so yes, and and so he's um, you know you know writing. So his Daily Planet is this comic book company, and then his Lois Lane is uh, Diana Dane, who's the writer who's a writer working on Warrior Woman, which is... A, so So you got Glory, who's a Wonder Woman analog, and then you got Warrior Woman, who's the comic within a comic. This is one of those fun things, too, man, where Eric Larson is, like, allowing his characters to be used in the piece, man. You got Mighty Man, you got uh, Golden Age Super Patriot. Yeah, that's why I wonder um, how much of this could be reprintable, because may, maybe Eric doesn't feel like having Super Patriot in there, you know, now for a reprint. I don't know. But so this, this was... So... Alan Moore wanted, uh, and I think maybe this was referenced on your uh, Jim Valentino episode, but it was like, Rob was kind of like, I want Alan Moore, but I don't want him doing that 1963 horse shit. Like, I want him to do, you know, real, like, 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 build off of Watchmen. Give me cutting edge modern comics. So this was like, you know, Alan Moore wanted to do all his old school pastiches. So this was kind of like a middle ground where it's like, I'll have these framing sequences that are drawn by, you know, uh, Good Rob Liefeld Studio. Team, team Extreme. Yeah, yeah, the, the Liefeld Studio guys doing those to kind of get, like, the young kids, like, who would have been us to, like, read this. And then, then I'm going to give you your vegetables. I'm going to give you the stuff I want to do, which which is the, this, like, retro stuff. And this this issue is about, say, the, the, the end of the Golden Age, essentially, man. Yeah. And uh, superheroes are on their ouch, just like real American comic book history. Like, once we come back from, from the war... Uh, the suburban parents, the new suburban parents, they're not really like uh, trying to focus on fighting all that much. Opens up rooms for other genres. Opens up room for EC Comics to flourish and explore different avenues and territories in, in the comic book format. Yeah, uh, I also have not read this whole run, Tom. So that context of like Supreme trying to figure out what happened, part of this story is he sends out like a beacon from, you know, the headquarters yeah. and these other characters come in glory. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the, these old golden age characters who help fill in the information and sort of frame mm -hmm. the flashback sequences. And uh, more seems like he's having fun. Like he's yes. playing with language in these, like here to wish you a happy grew year. You know, the three mayhem maniacs. Uh, there's a lot of sort of these word plays, which is uh, part of the, the EC. Yeah, it's yeah. the EC, but again, it's like, Holidays. that's what he's into too. Um, and I, yeah, I love his like, the morgue minder, like all his yeah. like fake crypt keeper names. The threatening threesome. <laughs> <laughs> There's and as as we go, like he touches on all of the great EC stories, yeah. man. Like from from all of the titles. So we have our Wallywood monsters and and aliens here, 
Um, we're going to have... It seems like all the artists are represented, too. So this is like the Wally Wood piece. Mm-hmm. There will be more Wally Wood pieces, but... And he's he's marrying sort of like EC aesthetic with like traditions from like DC Comics, from like Justice Society and Justice League, where yeah. every year they would have this tradition of like, um, there would be crises. They called it like a crisis. And it, it would be like, they'd meet alternate universe characters who would come in through like a thing very similar to that, you know, Futuroscope that they, they have in here. So he's really like taking all the stuff he's into and like weaving it together in interesting ways and having them play off of, and then like you said, actual comics history too. A uh, couple of the hand puppet going yes. to work there. That is kind of a fun gimmick. I it, like it. it lends itself well to these to this particular comic yeah. style. Well, you can imagine a lot of these solutions, these gimmicks he has to come up with are ways of, okay, I can't use Green Lantern, I can't use this, but it's Alan Moore doing it, so the solutions he comes up with are exquisite. All the guys we know and who we've done shoot interviews with say the same thing about working with Alan Moore, how you get like the pages and pages of description, and at the end there's that little like proviso or something where Moore is like, but if you have a better way to do it, by all means, go do it. And you get the impression that Robert Napton is like, I'm going to do my thing, man. Because <laughs> almost every one of his drawings is so boring. Like, like look at it compared, like, look at what Rick Veach is pulling. And you imagine that uh, this may have come from a script that is three paragraphs per panel. And then, like, what, Glory standing there? Even look at the color comparison. Totally. You know, for everything that was, was praised for digital color and production values that Image brought to the game, it's so bland, the coloring on this page. And it really shows next to this page that's popping with a bunch of primary colors, and this is just like tan, brown, gray. It's so garbage. <laughs> I, I mean, and You have infinite color palette, and you're doing tan, brown, gray. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, tell it to the world, you know, because people are still doing that. Uh, Alan Moore, like, very consciously wanted to collide these two approaches. He was really interested in that juxtaposition and the unfinished 1963, which predates this. That was the idea was it would end up in something like this, where you would see the four color next to the digital and and the the 50s, 60s, 40s next to the 90s. And you see the first person to answer Supreme's beacon is Glory. And uh, they kind of have that conversation about him not being sure where he's coming from and what was a dream and what was a real adventure. That's kind of a fun notion, especially considering superhero comics and how much of it is it gets retconned. It's you that, know. yeah, that's really what he was talking about. He was kind of like, okay, what would it be like if you were somebody within one of these comic book continuities that keeps getting revised? He's talking about crisis, and again, a lot of these ideas he might have used in a post-crisis, you know, Superman if he had become the regular Superman guy, or you know, before his falling out with DC Comics, and um, like. Also, in, in the, well, you have this, like, photo they keep referencing that's like the photo in Watchmen right. of, oh, look, everybody's so happy. And then one second later, it all turns to shit. And um, he, like, you get an, another kind of Watchmen thing where you, you do notice some stuff in the background that if you know the full story in this, it's like, oh, they're setting that up. Where, like, you see Magno, the super robot, a number of times just as, like, a background element. So then when he enters as, like, an actual factor in the plot, you, you've been primed. All right, our next our next dip into the EC world here. Shock stocks the suburbs, and this is uh, this is Veach doing. This is like Jack Davis girls, you mm-hmm. know, with the hair and stuff. Bill Ray's the other name on these flashbacks. I wonder what he's doing if he's inking or coloring what or think. what his contribution is. Yeah, it also says in the back that Hillary Barda did some like uncredited assist, uncredited within this, but it's credited in the in the letter column. Yeah, this stuff really feels like you're uh, you're nailing some of those D, some of the EC styles uh yes yeah, some yeah, of yeah, the yeah, I mean, that, that right there like that i you could probably produce the drawing that, that that's you know coming from yeah and it's the tropes here yes. are a murder by way of poison uh love triangle and and then the tr- the story tropes of just like thorough corruption there's yeah. like not a good guy to be found in any of these stories except for these superheroes who've sort of you know, crossed the dimensional boundary and entered this world of of just like misery. Yeah, she's making an acid bath for like her husband. Whenever he showers, it will just disintegrate. <laughs> yes, very easy, very crypt keeper. 
And then, and, and that I mean, we know the panel. You know, it's reference. You know, from look sh- at from all the shock, track marks <laughs> from shock suspense arm. stories. And and like uh, it was a bridge too far to call it heroin in 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 those comics. So they did call it a horse. <laughs> and so they they like maintain that. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's perfect. Into his hungry veins, sweet oblivion. <laughs> More loves playing with the purple kind of like comic book exposition. That's that's what he's in it for. And then this is the famous, uh, the famous Wally, Wally, Wally Wood, Wood yeah. uh, shock suspense story with like those like faux uh, clan guys. So this is the shock suspense stories, crime suspense stories, like portion of of our EC tale. And and like more talks about like in reference to Watchmen about like authority figures and stuff and how every single authority figure is corrupt. Like superheroes are authority figures, but then in this it's like, okay, this lady's trying to kill her husband. Let's go tell the cop. And then you find out the cops, the guy she's cheating with. And they're like, okay, well we got to tell the mayor. They go to the mayor right. and he's like, Oh, you, you, you're already dressed for the meeting, uh, referencing these robes. He's like, the mayor's at the meeting. And then so the mayor's like the head of the Ku Klux Klan. So it's like there's just nobody to turn to. Brother mayor. <laughs> and now we're back in the 90s. Back in the 90s and Eric Larson's Mighty Man making an appearance here. Part of that Golden Age team. Yeah, carrying Waxy Doyle, Wax Man. Man, like, I, I wish you guys would... Like, get a complete run and read... Because this stuff is delightful. This is, like, some of my favorite I'm comics. I'm going to read it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, I pulled all the issues. And then this is... T- to me, this is, like, the culmination point. And obviously, totally. you know, it's, like, mad. Okay, not only are you completely ill-equipped to fight society's ills, you're just fucking ridiculous. Like, you, you, you know... And, and this, again, is, like, metafictional kind of stuff. Pointing out the absurdity of their existence to these characters and, like, seeing what happens. Doing his... Damn this! It's yes. like it's like a mix between wood. There's the Will Elder chicken fat, which is actually even referenced yeah. in the text. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent chicken fat. <laughs> More for your moolah, and it's M O O R E. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of fun with language here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a fun th- like this particular story within mm-hmm. the story. I find really fun for all those reasons you said, Tom. It's colored, colored really well in the Marie Severin kind of style that was done with those things, where, where it's like you have your one focal point in the panels. We pointed out it out when we read Mad One. It's like you have your focal point, and then you just just spot color the the backgrounds because that stuff is way less important than you know the primary action. And th- think about the staging too. It's like nineteen. It's a New Year's Eve party, nineteen forty nine, becoming nineteen fifty, and we know what happened to comics between the forties and the fifties, and it's like. Bong, bong, bong. It's New Year's. Shouldn't we be happy? And instead, it's the, it's the you know the chimes of doom. It's the end of the superheroes. <laughs> I want to read the Moore script compared to the drawings because it's just like a more boring drawing can you find in in an Alan Moore comic. Yeah, and, and it's a spread. It'd be great if it was one panel that felt that way. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, interesting homage. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, the homage is interesting. And when you read this in the context of the larger work, it's it, it you know really comes alive. Flip, it's, flip that page. It's a fun time period for yeah. Maximum Press. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, like yeah, whenever they leave. Joint. Yeah, yeah, and a couple a couple pages of that surface as like back matter yes. in Supreme. Yeah, because only issue one of this is published, I believe. It was projected as like six issues or several issues, but I think only one comes out and then it runs as backups. But if you read all of this stuff, like it doesn't add up. Like Shaft number one, not that was never released, right? There was I don't never think so. a Shaft comic. But I, I love this period of Liefeld's work. I mean, it's it's like to me, it's like the sec the second wave because mm-hmm. like you had the OG like New Mutants X Force wave, but then when he discovers. Masamuni Shiro and starts to like find this kind of shit it's it's like an an extra burst of uh of energy and it's like you say I don't draw feet well check these feet out I'm drawing the fuck out of these feet (laughs) Chris Sprouse joining new men is interesting because he will take over the supreme art yes and Mm -hmm. and then of course go on to do the ABC uh Tom Strong exactly so a name that will become closer and closer linked with more and probably through this uh, Maximum Press connection initially. That's where I entered this Supreme series was just seeing like the Chris Sprouse issue on the rack being, hey, this looks pretty cool and seeing like the red, I was into retro comics and seeing all that and I'm like, this is cool and then just filling in the back issues. 
Yeah, Sprouls I, I always thought was really interesting. And my favorite of the Maximum Press guys were usually guys like this that did not have the extreme house style, yeah. Yeah. but but were legit good and like you know brought some original qualities to it. And uh, Sprouse is probably the, the poster child. For yeah, that. really really good collaborator for Alan Moore. And of course, you know they they stuck together for a while. It was pretty fun. And uh, Cable found a pair of those boots too. I think they're shopping <laughs> in the same same Footlocker. Tell you, man. <laughs> what do you say? Get out of here. That's it. K favors like follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. Jimmy, what's out there? Patreon.com slash Jim Rugg is where you can find my out of print, hard to find uh, zines and mini comics. You can download those. You can see a lot of my original art, how I make comics, including all the originals and process for the Red Room variant uh, covers that I've been doing for the last three issues. You got the perfect pairing Jack Kirby, The Epic Life of the King of Comics, and Fantastic Four Grand Design. Check out my Patreon, patreon.com, just search Tom Scholey, and check out my YouTube show, Total Recall Show, and follow me on Twitter, at Tom Scholey. Red Room Comics out in the wild, man. As of June 30th, two issues have hit the stands, and new comics come out uh, every four weeks. Uh, if, you don't have, if you don't have a good shop uh, close by to get the comic put on your pull list, you hit up uh, the Fantagraphics website. You could get there through my link tree in the description below this video. That link tree also takes you to my Patreon, where you can read uh, all the comics before they hit paper. Well over 100 pages, three bucks get you the archive there, and I put new strips up every Tuesday. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. Jimmy, give him one last set of merchandise, man. We're going to be on our way. Read more comics. <laughs>